Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and yesterday the world was taken by surprise when SpaceX won NASA's Human Landing System Award, which um, frankly is seems kind of ridiculous, especially when you put all three competitors next to each other and you realize that SpaceX's Starship towers like a monolith over the other options. We always thought it was a long shot to have this in there and it might be taken as an insurance option, but it's the only option that NASA has chosen. They're gonna get $2.9 billion over the next few years and this is to test, develop, demonstrate the vehicle. Now, it's not going to cover long-term lunar landing, that's coming later, but they will, will in theory, be the people to carry the first uh, humans from the US back to the moon uh, at some point in the next decade. So yeah, look, this caught us be su by surprise because of the choice, but it also caught us by surprise because it was suddenly sort of leaked at the last minute. Um, I think what happened was on Friday morning, there were news stories starting to appear that SpaceX had won it, and then Washington Post suddenly had a copy of NASA's internal document with all the details. And suddenly NASA says, oh, we're gonna have a press conference at 4 p.m. on a Friday. Who has a press conference at 4 p.m. on Friday? Someone that's really trying to address something before the weekend. So yeah, they, they have this. It was nicely produced. I think it was probably coming maybe next week, but uh, yeah, uh, SpaceX won it. There was nobody from SpaceX answering questions at this press conference, which led to some interesting problems where they would, you know, people would have very good questions for SpaceX, and they said, "Ask SpaceX." Oh, they're not here. I mean, to be fair, some of the questions were things like, "How does Starship integrate with SLS?" and that's a question best answered using Kerbal Space Program rather than actual science. The source selection statement also showed that uh, the national team, consisting of Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, uh, Northrop Grumman, and Draper, they would have been the second choice, and the Dynetics lander, which I liked for many reasons, that would have been the third choice, but these were all largely driven by cost. The cost was the biggest problem. If you remember, the previous administration had basically asked for something like $3 billion to fund the Human Landing System Development Program. And Congress was like, well, we can't steer this money to our district, so we're just going to give you a billion dollars. It wasn't even that. It might have been less. But within that lower budget, none of the options that had been submitted were actually could be funded at that level. So they worked with, NASA worked with the various bidders and got SpaceX to not change the amount of money they were asking for, but to adjust the timeline so the first year could fit within the money that they had available. And SpaceX were the only one that were even remotely in the ballpark, so they are pretty much the winners. And this is not going to make many people in Congress happy. I mean, like, it's an open competition and there's lobbyists from various groups, but I don't think SpaceX have quite the same draw as you know, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Blue Origin, etc. cetera. Uh, there's already been at least one complaint by, uh, I think it was chairman or chairwoman of some committee that does it works on spending, basically saying, why are you making this critical decision on the human landing system before we have approved the new NASA administrator and deputy administrator? And also, by the way, lost in the news yesterday was that the official nomination for Pam Melroy as deputy administrator came out. So I'm excited for her because she is a legitimate, awesome, you know, astronaut space person. Uh, hopefully will do great things for NASA. But yeah, with you, know, it's entirely possible that there will be uh, appeals and there might be some you know, political ram rummaging. But I'm hoping this doesn't mean so much that SpaceX has a chance of losing this so much that we have a chance to get the funding you would need for a second option because I think dissimilar redundancy is something that is very important when you're trying to do things fast. And I will say, by the way, that the human landing system submission process, they were targeting the 2024 landing date. That is clearly not going to happen. So there is a lot more leeway, a lot more wiggle room in this than is otherwise suggested by the um, by this source selection. So anyway, yeah, let, let's let's go back and look at the competitors, remember? So yeah, 
when it was announced or when the, the finalists were shown off, everybody thought that the national team had probably the strongest bid because it looked closest to what NASA wanted. So the national team, Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, it was a three-stage lander. You had the ascent stage, which had the human's ca cabin in it, uh, where the people would fly. Um, there was a descent stage that would carry that to the moon. And then there was a tug, like an orbital element, which would carry this stack from the halo orbit at the gateway down to low lunar orbit and then stay in orbit. And then when the ascent element returned, it would carry the ascent element back to the gateway again. So this in many ways matched what NASA was looking for, but it didn't win because it turns out that it was very expensive and there were technical issues. Dynetics, they had a radical idea, which I really liked because instead of building this thing as a vertical stack, they sort of built it sideways where you had this cabin in the middle which would pretty much settle right on the moon. So you could actually step out of the airlock and down a couple of steps onto the moon rather than descending this really huge ladder on the side of the national team. The national team's lander was 40 meters tall. And you know, to be fair, Dynetics lander was that tall if you included the solar panels that stuck upwards. But yeah, the rocket engines would be on the side and then they would have drop tanks that would be dropped during the descent towards the moon. Um, and anyway, and then we finally come to Starship. We all know what Starship looks like. It's big and stainless steel with wings. This is a slightly different version, which has, uh, it's painted white. It has a ring of solar panels, a black section around it. Has uh, none of the fins because there's no air on the moon and you have to actually use rocket engines to slow down. But for final landing, it had a ring of angled engines about halfway up the rocket. and. We're not clear on what those engines are, but the new render shows that there's something like 25 of them. So that's far too many for them to be super Dracos. So this would probably have to be some sort of new thruster that uses methane and liquid oxygen, hopefully. Hopefully. Um, yeah, I mean, there's other things that are, have changed in the new Starship render now that we've got the, the winners out there. The, the legs have been expanded because the landing legs that are currently on the test vehicles, uh, obviously those are small and temporary, but even when they get towards a production leg design, they're still going to have to fit within a sort of narrow envelope so that they can be, they can be screened from the aerodynamic effects. Whereas for the moon, they can just have big legs that fold out and provide a wider base. So these have at least four legs. It's kind of hard to tell. The geometry doesn't look quite right with big landing pads like, you know, you know, two, three meter wide landing pads. Um, the, well, you know, I think these things, once they're deployed, they might stay deployed with some sort of shock absorber. Yeah, and there's a, you know, new solar panels on there and new, new landing thruster designs. But there's also some changes to the nose because obviously it's going to have to be docking to other spacecraft. So the selection statement, it, it looked hard at all of these pro, uh, these proposals. I mean, you know, of course, we are looking at Starship and many people are trying to criticize it for their various problems or whatever. But you know, to be fair, all the teams have built hardware for this proposal. Uh, Blue Origin and uh, Dynetics, they both have these fantastic mock-ups showing high fidelity human, you know, the human factor as part of the lander so you can get in and look inside them. Uh, SpaceX have built a lot of, well, flying things that have become scrap things, but building stuff that actually flies put them ahead of the curve quite significantly, even if they haven't failed to you know, demonstrate a proper complete landing cycle. But what NASA saw when they looked at Starship was they saw a vehicle that wasn't breaking the laws of physics in any way. It, did, it required lots of R&D, but so did the other competitors, and it was just so much larger. It had two airlocks with independent life support systems, which you know, really expand your survivability envelope. Also, it had a lot of room for expansion. And while this wasn't part of this proposal, the teams were required to come up with you know, proposals for how they would extend their lander and, and turn it into a more sustainable system. And SpaceX had lots of space to expand and lots of margin everywhere. 
Dynetics actually came into the competition with their proposal when it was analyzed by NASA they found that they had negative mass. They were carrying negative mass mansion. No, no, I mean, like you think negative mass, oh, that's cool, it floats upward. No, no, negative mass margin is bad. It means that your design is heavier than it should be and you have to somehow cut mass from it rather than having room to grow when you're encountering problems. That was like a big negative. It got there, it was a big part of why Dynetics rating went from being acceptable to being marginal. Um, you know, all the teams had various technologies that were identified as having low technological readiness levels. Uh, the propulsion systems for the national team in particular, there were multiple propulsion systems, none of which had been really properly developed at this time. SpaceX, at least, of course, have their Raptors, and those are actually flying, even if they are uh, sometimes involved in giant RUDs. And incidentally, the SN15, we're now starting to see the new generation of Raptors coming down to Boca Chica. And there's a number of changes to this design. They're not radical, but if you look, you can see your know, pipe layouts change. Some of the manifold designs have been recast. So hoping that that will improve their uh, reliability. Now, the national team, by the way, it, it was noticed that they also had a non-compliant bid, which basically said part of the proposal, part of the requirements was that the bids had to not have any advance payments for work that would be done in the future. They had to be, they had to be structured in such a way that they weren't getting a lot of money up front. And yeah, the national team had this by accident, supposedly, and NASA would have had to negotiate with them to fix this, to make it compliant. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's one of these things you only discover when you really start looking hard at things. Um, SpaceX, the, one of the concerns with SpaceX was the fact that refueling this thing is going to take like half a dozen flights to get the uh, tanker filled up in orbit. But sort of the upside of that was that all this refueling stuff needed to happen in low Earth orbit. And that actually, you know, worked well for them so they could load up the tanker and if there were problems they would have to have time to adjust their schedule it was a relatively easy target. Whereas the other landers all required refueling, but their design had the lander sent out to the moon, and then in lunar orbit, they would be assembled and refueled. And that, uh, that was, of course, that needed fewer launches, but it wasn't in low Earth orbit, so that counted, you know, there was a, there was a bit of a wash either way. The, the, all of these things are fairly complex compared to building a ginormous Saturn V and putting all your stuff onto a single launch. Um, yeah, but I think, yeah, the biggest factor ultimately is that SpaceX, bizarrely, despite having this monster lander, were the cheapest. And that's all they could afford to do. And a lot of this is down to SpaceX already developing it with their own money and with uh, other investors because they have specific tasks in mind, not just for Starship, but for Super Heavy in general. And that counts for a lot. It may be reaching high, it may be pushing things at, at the limits, but that's ultimately how, how this works. And you know, of course, this then says, well, what does that mean for the rest of Artemis? Because this is so much bigger than anything else there. It's bigger than if you dock all the parts of the gateway together, Starship is still going to be bigger than all of that. It's going to look a bit ridiculous <laughs> at some point. And, you know, maybe this just represents a sort of inflection point where NASA is now seeing the wisdom of Starship through all the various programs and does want to get involved because they see it as a viable way forwards. Uh, of course, things could go wrong. Things are, We've got several years before this is fully development, developed, but it's entirely possible we look back and we see this moment as being a critical, yeah, a critical moment in development of human spaceflight going forwards. So in many ways, I'm excited by this. I'm also, of course, would really like to see a competitor regardless because I think it's good and having more money for the space program is always fantastic. And I think it will make the hearings of Bill Nelson a little more spicy than we uh, were expecting. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.